the session. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Martin J. Wainwright from UC Berkeley. He got his PhD at uh, MIT, and he is the winner of 2002 George M. Sproul Prize. His uh, uh, lecture title is Constrained Forms of Statistical Minimax, Computation, Communication, and Privacy. Let's welcome the speaker. Okay, so uh, first off, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. It's, it's a real pleasure on my part. And so what I'm going to be talking about is the theory of statistical minimax. Um, it's a very classical theory, sort of a cornerstone of what's known as statistical decision theory. Um, but I want to take a fresh or modern take on it. I want to revisit it in the light of constraints that modern applications present. Um, so let's sort of begin by saying what we mean by statistical estimation in an abstract sense. Um, so what we mean is we have some family of distributions. P is a distribution in some family. We have some functional on that family. It could be something like the mean of the random variable. It could be something more general like a density function. Um, so some quantity of interest that we'd like to estimate that we call theta. We're given a bunch of samples that are drawn according to some p from this family. And then an estimator is some function, a measurable function of those samples. Those are random variables. So it's a function that takes the data and maps it to some estimate theta hat. Right, so that's estimation in an abstract sense. And we can ask many questions given this setup. So the first thing we might like to ask, what's a good estimator? Um, and of course, that depends on what you'd like to use it for. So we're going to introduce some loss function, typically a norm. So something like L2 norm if I was estimating a mean, or Hamming loss if I was estimating binary variables, and so on. So we have a loss function. And that tells us, given an output theta hat of our estimator and the truth theta, how good is that estimate? Now that's a random quantity because the data is random, so we'd like to look at its expectation. That defines something known as the risk function. Okay, so the risk function is going to be a central object here. Right, so what it's saying is, on average, if you took your estimator theta hat, if the true parameter were theta, you applied it many, many times over many different samples of the data, how well would you do on average? Right, so that's called the risk function. And the way to think about it is, it's really a function, if I fix the estimator, I fix some theta hat, as the thing that I'm trying to estimate varies, if that were a mean, if that varies over the space, I get a different number for each possible choice of the, the true value. And so for a given estimator, I get some curve that traces out the quality of that estimator as a function of the underlying truth. Right? So for every estimator, you have a whole function, a risk function. And so now, of course, if you want to say something unambiguous, you'd like to scalarize that. You'd like to give one number for each estimator. And there are different ways of doing that. Um, if you were a Bayesian, you might put a probability distribution over your parameter space. You might have a, a prior on theta, and you might integrate the risk function against that prior. Um, in minimax theory, you do something a little more adversarial. You imagine that nature is um, evil. And what nature is going to do is search over this parameter space and take the worst case of your estimator. Right. So if we do that, that defines a classical min-max problem um, that's known as Wald's min-max criterion, um, has obvious game theoretic interpretations. So the min-max risk for a given problem is given by taking a, a soup over all distributions in your family, or equivalently soup over all parameters, and then an inf over all estimators um, that are measurable functions of the data. So it's like a game. Nature is being evil, choosing bad parameters, you're doing your best to try and choose an estimator that minimizes the worst case risk. Okay, so this really is a two-party game. As I said, nature chooses a bad distribution, and you choose a good estimator. And um, what are some standard questions that statisticians spend a lot of their time asking? Um, so the risk, 
really here is a function of n. If I had n samples, then theta hat is a function of n different samples. So you're interested in how quickly does that risk go to zero as n goes to infinity. Um, if you have a reasonable estimator, as you get more and more data, you should get closer to the truth. And if you want a quantitative understanding, then you ask about the rate at which it goes to zero. Um, you can ask about other things. You can ask how does the risk depend on things like dimensionality of your problem. If you're estimating a function like a density, I'll show you an example in a minute, how does it depend on the smoothness of the density? Um, and the last thing you can ask, what are optimal estimators? Um, is this saddle point problem achieved? And if so, what is the form of these optimal estimators? Okay, so that's what's going to be of interest to us today, is, is the form of optimal estimators. Right, because in this classical formulation, this enthemum here is, is really not very constrained at all. Um, you have to have a measurable function of your data, but apart from that, there are no constraints whatsoever. Um, you could have a function that takes exponential time to compute. You could have a function that requires exponential storage. Um, your estimator is allowed centralized access to all the data simultaneously. Your data is not partitioned, let's say, across several machines. Um, so in some sense, this is actually unrealistic uh, in modern cases to have such an unconstrained set of estimators over which to optimize. So that, that brings us to the subject of these lectures. Um, well, actually, let me just give you a canonical example before I go on to that. Let's look at density estimation just so you get a, a flavor of things. So in density estimation, um, you're looking at distributions that have some density. So densities belong to L2. Um, so your functional here is, is actually the density. That's what you'd like to estimate. Um, a standard loss function would be something like the L2 um, norm, integrated squared error. And um, so what's going on? You have a density, this blue curve. You're getting samples that are being drawn according to this density, so presumably you have more samples in peakier regions of the density. And you'd like to use those samples, your estimator as a function of these samples, to densities, and you'd like to have an estimator that's um, small in this sense. So this is a, a classical example. The minimax rates are well known. Let me just show them because this will come up later. Um, so, as I said, often you're interested in looking at things like smoothness, right? If your density is smoother, then somehow intuitively it should be easier to estimate. Um, so what you can do is you can look at Sobolev classes. Roughly speaking, these are classes of densities that have a certain number of derivatives, some smoothness beta. And then it's known that over these families, the minimax risk drops like 1 over n, so it's going down as the sample size goes down. And you get an exponent that's well known. It's 2 beta over 2 beta plus 1, that, where beta is the smoothness. So for instance, if you have Lipschitz densities, you get an exponent of 2 thirds. Um, beta is 1 for Lipschitz. Um, if you have densities that sort of have infinitely many derivatives, things like C infinity in the limit, you would get um, the exponent would tend to a half. And, or actually, sorry, to 1. And that's what you'd expect. That's a kind of parametric rate. So we're going to revisit this in a minute. I, I showed this because we're going to revisit this um, when we have further constraints on our estimators. Okay, so as I said, the classical framework doesn't have any constraints. And in many settings, I think this is unrealistic, right? So in practice, we don't have unbounded memory and computational power. Um, certainly, if the complexity of implementing an estimator scales exponentially in n, or the dimension, it's something that will never be implemented. Um, frankly, if it even scales badly in a polynomial sense, if it's something like n to the 10, if you think n is 10,000, um, that's never going to be implemented either. So realistically, one has to have estimators that have polynomial and low polynomial time. Um, another issue is that classically one assumes that when you implement an estimator, you have somewhere where all the data is stored, a central site where it's all aggregated. That's also not realistic. If you go and try and solve problems, for instance, some of you may have heard of the Netflix challenge of predicting matrices, um, there's no way you can store all the data on one computer. What you have to do in practice is split the data into multiple parts, do local operations on each, and then communicate between processors. 
Right? So that's another interesting form of constraint that one would impose on an estimator. You would say, I want my data to be distributed, and I would like a limit on the number of bits that can be communicated from processor to processor. Um, a third topic, and I'll talk about this in detail next, is, is the issue of privacy. Right? We're collecting more and more data these days, and um, that's interesting, but it's also dangerous. Um, privacy has certainly become increasingly topical in the news these days. And so what's often desirable, I would argue, is you'd like estimators that have some kind of privacy-preserving properties. And I'll formalize this in a minute, but roughly speaking, this means that you can still estimate things like the density, but you don't actually learn too much about any individual data point that's an individual, so you protect their privacy in some sense. Okay, so these are the kinds of constraints that are motivating um, an ongoing line of work, um, of which I've been part, but many people are, are working on this these days in a broad sense, um, which is essentially to, minimum, to revisit this classical Minimax framework, but to try and incorporate and formalize these kinds of constraints, and try to understand when does the Minimax reg change when you have these kinds of constraints imposed. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to give you two little vignettes. I will not talk about distributed estimation, but I will talk about privacy, and I will talk about computational constraints. So I'll give you two vignettes of things that can be um, said along these lines. Okay, so let's begin with privacy. Okay, so lots of data is being collected. Um, you could have your genome sequenced. Um, you might answer questionnaires about your sexual behavior, um, your financial data, and so on. And there's obvious privacy concerns with all of these forms of data. Um, at the same time, you could argue that at a, at a broader level, at a societal level, there are benefits to collecting these kinds of data. Um, for instance, people's sexual behavior can be used to um, figure out how diseases spread. It's useful for epidemiology. Um, financial data and so on can be used for improved economic forecasting. Um, so there's a natural tension here between privacy at an individual level and sort of larger scale community or societal benefits. Okay, we'd like to formalize, how can we capture that tension in a mathematical way? Okay, so <clears throat> this is the model of privacy that we'll look at. So on the left, what we have is the original data. That's what I've been talking about. These are the original samples that a classical estimator would see directly. But what we're going to do now is we're going to imagine that um, we don't want, for instance, imagine this person, this unit here is Google. Um, we don't want Google to have access to all of the samples. We don't want Google to see the raw samples because then they can do evil things with, with the data. It's sort of ironic actually that Google says, you know, its motto is do no evil. That might have been true 10 years ago, but I really don't think that's true anymore. So let's think about this as Google. We don't trust Google. And so what we'd like is some mechanism, it's called a release mechanism. We're going to release a different version of the random variables here. And formally that means that we have a, pro a conditional probability distribution over n random variables, the private ones, z, conditioned on the, sorry, the privatized or public ones conditioned on the private ones. Okay, so what's going to happen is we'll release these z's. Everybody can see those. And the estimators now are going to be a function of the z's, not of the x's. Um, but we'd like the z's to somehow have some privacy-preserving guarantees. Right? So that's going to impose some restriction on how we choose this conditional distribution, or this mechanism q. So there's different ways of formalizing. This is a, a particular version that's due to Cynthia Dwork and her collaborators. Um, and so it's... It's um, a definition of privacy that's parameterized by a number alpha. When alpha is very small, you have a lot of privacy. When alpha is large, you have very little privacy. And what it essentially says, it's, it's a condition on this conditional distribution. So what it says is, let's look at the form of the conditional distribution. So z is the public data. We're varying the public data. And what we imagine is that we have two underlying data sets, x and x bar. Okay, x and x bar have n samples, and what we imagine is that someone comes along and flips one of the samples. Maybe we were asking you about your sexual behavior, and then one of you, your answer was flipped. So we have two data sets, and one of you, the answer has changed. And so what it means to be private, um, the question you want to ask is, 
if you had two data sets that were different in just one coordinate, could an adversary that was looking at those two data sets detect the difference easily? Um, and the way you can make that problem hard is by putting a bound on the likelihood ratio. You say that the likelihood ratio is sandwiched uniformly between e to the alpha and e to the minus alpha. So if alpha is zero, there's essentially no information. As alpha grows, you have an increasing amount of information. So we now have a one-parameter family that describes um, privacy in some sense. Okay, so this is the testing interpretation that I gave. You sort of imagine you have two data sets. Um, an adversary, for instance, Google, looks at the privatized data set Z, and they want to test between which of the two data sets it is. And the data sets are perturbed in a single coordinate. And um, what this definition does is it says that any test you can construct um, will have an error probability that's relatively close to a half as long as alpha is relatively close to zero. Right? So this is something that's known as disclosure risk. It says that if I release the data Z, I'm not actually risking that much disclosure about any individual person. Okay, so there are many mechanisms that have this property of, of being alpha locally private. Um, possibly the most widely studied one is called the Laplacian mechanism for obvious reasons. Um, it means that you take your public data X and you just add a Laplace variable to it. Right, so a Laplace distribution is non-Gaussian, it's sort of spiky with slightly heavier tails. Um, and you can do a little calculation, as long as X is in a bounded domain, then it's easy to see that this is um, alpha private in the sense that we just defined. It is important that you have heavier tails. Gaussian noise, for instance, wouldn't work. You, you do need sort of this linear tail behavior, at least. Um, and there's many other mechanisms. Um, actually, back in the 60s, statisticians had a, a simple mechanism. Basically, you just, if someone asks you a binary question, you just flip a coin with a certain probability, and you change the answer with some small p. That's called randomized response. It actually has a, a certain kind of alpha privacy as well. Um, so there are many mechanisms, and um, there's a long line of work on privacy and estimation. Um, I won't go in, into it in too much detail here, but I'm certainly happy to discuss um, offline in more detail. But broadly speaking, sort of what people are trying to answer here is, is the following question. You'd like to have a trade-off, and you'd like to have a precise characterization of what are the trade-offs between privacy, between having an alpha guarantee of privacy, and how statistically useful the privatized data is. Obviously, it's a little noisier if you add Laplace noise, you're increasing variability, but precisely how does it depend on alpha and how does it depend on dimension and other things in your problem? So that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to um, provide a characterization of the trade-off between privacy and statistical utility. Okay, so this leads to a slight variant. Before we spoke about the classical minimax risk, we can now look at an extension of it. So we have the same setup as before. We have a family of distributions. We have samples. We have estimators. Um, we have a loss function. And now the only twist that we're going to add here, well, two little twists. So first of all, these are no longer private. These are no longer public, that's private data. You don't see that. What you do see are the privatized samples. Um, so estimators are now functions of the private data, of the public data. And we have our usual inf soup here. That's the classical minimax risk. But we have another interesting quantity. We have a third inf here, right? Because there are many ways of guaranteeing alpha privacy. We could use Laplacian noise. We could use an exponential mechanism. There's an infinity of ways for a given alpha of choosing Q, the mechanism, so you have alpha privacy. But which one is best, right? The sense of best here is the one that's best is the one that preserves the most utility about the data. And that's what's known as an optimal mechanism. And if we can characterize this risk function, then we'll have some understanding of what, what is the optimal way of noisifying your data to preserve privacy while still um, retaining utility. Okay, so as alpha gets very large, this constraint becomes um, negligible. So what's interesting here is really the behavior of this function for alpha close to zero, and that, that's what our theory will, will characterize. 
Okay, so let's revisit the problem of non-parametric density estimation. Um, I just want to give you a flavor of how the minimax risk can change in what we think are interesting and surprising ways. So if we're estimating densities, um, what we saw before is that if you have some smoothness parameter beta, you get an exponent that's 2 beta over 2 beta plus 1, and that's optimal. So what we'd like to understand now is if, in addition, we have a privacy constraint, um, can we still get this rate, or is the rate much slower? It can't be faster, of course, because we're constraining our estimators. Um, so here's a result that characterizes what happens for density estimation. So now we're doing density estimation. We have an alpha private mechanism. We're taking the best one. We're taking the inf over all alpha private mechanisms. And we're doing density estimations based on these. We don't observe directly the x's anymore. So here's the minimax rate for small values of alpha. Um, so there's two differences. One is that instead of 1 over n, you get alpha squared times n. Um, it's as if you've sort of lost an alpha squared fraction of your data. So if alpha were 0.1, you basically need a sample size that's 100 times larger just to get this term the same as 1 over n. So that can be significant. Um, now, asymptotically, what's going to be more significant is the exponents actually change. Instead of 2 beta, 2 beta plus 1, you get 2 beta over 2 beta plus 2. Um, so in the case of Lipschitz densities, instead of two-thirds, you get one-half. So you've sort of lost um, some fraction of your exponent. Now as beta goes to infinity again, um, it returns to one. So in the limit of perfectly smooth densities, you don't lose anything except for the alpha squared. But as, if your densities don't have infinitely many derivatives, you're losing something more. Um, and so we can give a simple scheme that achieves this rate, and so that actually tells us what the optimal mechanism is. Um, it's not a Laplacian mechanism. If you do something with a Laplacian mechanism, you'll get a worse rate. The exponent will be 2 beta over 2 beta plus 5. So you have to be a bit more clever. Laplace is not optimal here. Um, but it's still computationally relatively simple in this case. Um, yeah, so this is just a little calculation. How many samples would I need to achieve an error, let's say, at 0.01 if I had Lipschitz densities? Um, it's roughly a, a factor of 100 um, multiple here. Right? So your sample size really is blowing up. It's telling you there's a significant price for privacy in this particular case. OK, so um, I don't want to go into the proof. Um, what we have is sort of a more general theory. But let me just sort of sketch the ingredients that enter into these kinds of problems. Um, some of them are standard, um, standard parts of statistical minimax theory, how to derive lower bounds. But then I'll, I'll try and clarify what's new. What's new actually is a form of uh, what's known as a quantitative data processing inequality. Okay, so we're trying to prove lower bounds on estimating densities. And of course, there's infinitely many densities of a given smoothness. So we'd like some way of quantifying how big are these classes, right? Intuitively, how big the class is should tell us how hard it is to estimate. So this question was answered by Kolmogorov and uh, the Russian school. Um, what you use is the notion of metric entropy. Right? So metric entropy sort of says, if metric entropy at level delta says, roughly speaking, how many balls of radius delta can I pack into the function space? Or essentially equivalently, how many balls can I pack in that are, whose centers are all separated by 2 delta, a distance 2 delta? Right? So this is... Uh, something that's well studied in approximation theory and so on. And it gives us a, a sort of way of assessing the sizes of, of function classes. Obviously, smooth functions, there's fewer of them than um, less smooth functions. Now, where does statistics come in? Well, remember that minimax is like a two-person game. So to prove a lower bound, what you actually do is you look at a limited version of a two-person game. You limit what nature can do. Um, you sort of tell nature, I'm going to fix some 2 delta packing of the space. And what you're allowed to do is you can choose one of these ball centers uniformly at random. Okay? And then you're going to draw samples from the density that's indexed by that ball center. So that's an easier problem in some sense. But because we're trying to prove a lower bound, it's okay. We just need to exhibit one hard problem. 
And this problem, if we construct the packing appropriately, will be hard enough. Okay? And um, so what one then argues is that suppose you, suppose you had an estimator that with high probability returned an estimate that was, let's say, delta close to the ball center. That would say that you landed inside this ball. So that means that you could always figure out which ball center had been chosen by nature. So you could solve the testing problem of figuring out the random index that nature chose. Okay? So when you have testing problems, then information theory comes in. Um, Fano's inequality is a, a classical result from information theory that tells you how to lower bound testing probability in terms of mutual information. And that's where privacy comes in. Okay, so the usual argument is with Fano's inequality is we have a packing index that's uniformly distributed. Um, the usual argument applies directly to x because we observe x, but in this case we don't observe x. What we observe is z, the public data. So what we'd like to understand is how much mutual information is lost along this link of the graph. The data processing inequality says that it, the mutual information won't increase, you have noise here, but how much is lost? And so the theorem that underlies this particular problem is what you show is that the mutual information between the public data and the random index that controls how hard the problem is, is at most e to the alpha minus one squared, that's roughly alpha squared, that's where the alpha squared term comes from. And then there's a more complicated variational quantity that actually um, captures the dimension-dependent effect of this problem. Um, what this says is you're allowed to choose a function that's bounded in L infinity, and you'd like to choose that function so that you have many different densities, pj1 through m, and you have the average density. You'd like that function to align well with all of those differences at the same time. Um, you'd like to make that big. But if you have many different densities that are all pointing in different directions, you can't choose a single function that aligns well with all of them at the same time. And actually that effect, the difficulty of this problem grows as the dimension grows. And so this actually shrinks as the dimension of your problem grows. So that means that your mutual information decays. It means that your problem gets harder and harder. And because of that dimension dependent effect, that's why the exponent in density estimation changes. That's a particular corollary of this quantitative data processing inequality. Um, so these kinds of results, these quantitative data processing, are of, of more general interest in mathematics. People in information theory study, study them, people in concentration of measure study them. They have all sorts of interesting probabilistic consequences in addition to these statistical ones. Okay, so just to wrap up, so the main theorems here are, are quantitative data processing, and what it sort of gives us is a way of understanding this trade-off between privacy and statistical utility. Um, there's many open questions, but just in the interest of time, I'll, I think I'll, I'll move on to the next part. I can discuss this offline if people are interested. Okay, so let's think about another kind of constraint that we can put on minimax risk. Um, so when we're discussing classical risk, remember it has no sense of computation. There's no bounds on computational complexity, you can have unlimited storage and so on. And um, it's very natural instead, if you actually want to implement things, you want theory that's relevant to practice, you'd like to consider forms of minimax that have these constraints. Um, so there's two kinds of interesting questions here. They're essentially converses of one another. Um, the first is, when can the classical minimax risk be achieved by an estimator that's efficient, by an estimator that uses only polynomial time and storage and so on? And what's interesting here is, even though um, classically mathematical statisticians haven't thought so much about computation, um, I would say in most known cases, we can achieve minimax risks with simple methods. Um, certainly for density estimation, all those examples I showed you, there are many, many polynomial time methods, super efficient, very fast, at least in fixed dimension, that will achieve the um, minimax risk. Um, I think another sort of interesting development over the past decades is what one might call the unreasonable success of convex relaxation. For instance, um, Emmanuel Candace's lecture at this ICM, of course, was on exactly this topic. 
And what I mean by this is for many uh, statistical problems that have combinatorial constraints, like sparsity or rank constraints and so on, um, just doing the naive first order relaxation of them often yields estimators that are minimax optimal. Um, that's why it's in some sense unreasonable because you've done the simplest possible thing. You haven't looked at all these complicated hierarchies that are being studied, for instance, Lasserre and Shirley Adams and so on. Um, the sort of con converse question is, are there gaps between classical and computationally constrained minimax risks? And I think that's where the story is getting most interesting. Um, there's a recent line of work that's been studying um, the problem of a sparse form of principal components analysis and establishing certain kinds of hardness results um, under an average case hardness of the planted cleat problem. Um, so I won't go into detail on this line of work, but it's, it's a very nice line of work. They essentially show a nice gap between what you can do with a polynomial time algorithm and what you can do with exponential time search. Um, what I would like to talk about is, is a recent result of, in which I was involved, which actually shows what we think is a fairly surprising gap for estimating sparse linear models. So this is the domain of compressed sensing or sparse regression in the Lasso and so on. Um, now why we find this surprising is because there's just been a whole um, tidal wave of results that are all of the positive flavor, basically saying L1 is great, L1 is essentially as good as up to constants as any other estimator and so on. Um, but it turns out that if you look at a particular criterion, L1 is suboptimal. Um, and it's suboptimal conditioned on a conjecture in um, complexity theory that's widely believed. Um, if you were in Ryan Williams' talk uh, yesterday, he discussed these two classes, MP and P poly. So let me just give you a flavor of the result. So what is a sparse linear model? Well, a sparse linear model is very simple. You observe an n vector and an n by d matrix x. That's your response vector and your design matrix. Um, you're trying to recover or estimate something about an unknown sparse vector, theta star. Um, sometimes people look at a noiseless form, but in the general setting, you also have some noise, w. You have an n vector of noise variables. OK? And so what's interesting here is you have three parameters now. You have n, d, so the number of observations, dimension of the problem, and the sparsity, k, of the problem. And you'd like to understand as a function of those three variables um, what is possible and what's not possible. Um, so what we're going to look at is um, a criterion of goodness. This is a, a semi-norm known as the prediction error. Um, so what this says is if you have an estimate, theta hat, of the unknown truth, the way I'm going to measure it is I'm going to look at this quantity here, or equivalently it's sort of the average of the response that your model predicts given um, input xi versus the true response, and we look at the mean squared error um, of the predicted responses. Okay, so this would be of interest if at some level you don't really care about theta star per se, all you care about is can I build a good predictive model or not. This criterion measures how well do you predict um, in an in-sample sense. Okay, so let's sort of, to warm up and just understand the classical minimax rate. So if computation were not a concern, then um, what would be optimal but is computationally infeasible is you would solve a least squares problem over an L0 ball. You'd be minimizing over the very non-convex set of vectors that have at most k non-zeros. Now, this is pretty easy to analyze. Um, it was done by Junea et al. And um, what you can say is essentially with no assumptions on x, that's very important, there's no assumptions on x. x could have columns that are identical, that have very weird correlations. There's no sense of restricted isometry or incoherence needed here. So with no assumptions on x, um, a noise vector with reasonable tail conditions, um, in a uniform sense over k sparse vectors, you can get an error that scales like the noise variance times k log d over n. Um, if you want to be a little more precise, you can get d over k, but let's not worry about that difference here. If k is much smaller than d, then that's the sort of minimax rate. Okay, so what we'd like to understand is, um, well, if we now restrict ourselves to methods that are computationally feasible, this in general requires exponential time search because you have d choose k subsets to look at. So let's start looking at practical algorithms. How do they behave? Um, 
Well, the algorithm that's been looked at most is the simplest first order relaxation of L0. You just take the L0 constraint, replace it by an L1 constraint. Okay, so that gives you a constrained quadratic program. It's convex. Standard algorithms can solve it to epsilon accuracy in public and real time, so there's no problems there. Um, how does this method behave in practice? Now, here's where things get a little funny. The existing theory requires a restricted eigenvalue condition. Um, roughly what this condition says is that if you look at the behavior of this quadratic form, it's determined by your design matrix, but you look at, at it over a set, a cone, a, a set of vectors that are relatively sparse in some sense, um, then you should still have good curvature in all those directions. This condition is, is implied, for instance, by restricted isometry, but it's quite a bit weaker. This is basically the weakest known condition under which L1 works. Um, sort of more generally, if, if you know about optimization, this is really a, a notion of restricted strong convexity. What it's saying is, this is for the special case of the least squares function, but more generally, we can ask if we look at the Taylor series error in a convex function, when is, the, is it the case that it's strongly convex in a subset of directions? Um, that turns out to be the case if, if X, for instance, is sampled from an appropriate um, uh, ensemble of random matrices. Um, so geometrically, what this is saying is you have a cone, and it's saying that you have a, a cost function that's very curved in some directions, but in general is completely flat in other directions. Now, if you wanted to actually recover theta star, um, if you think about it, this condition can't be avoided. Because if you actually want to recover theta star, you have to be able to see small changes in the parameter vector will have to induce changes in the cost function, because the cost function is the only thing that the algorithm can see. But if you care about prediction error, um, there's no need, there's no reason why you would ever need this condition. And indeed, the L0 estimator does not need this condition. It imposes no conditions on X. But L1, the best known results for L1 seem to require this condition. Okay, so this is the best known result for a polynomial time method for prediction error for a k-sparse vector. Um, this is due to Bickel, Ritov, and Sivakov. Um, it assumes that you have a gamma RE condition of this form, a restricted eigenvalue condition. You again have reasonable noise conditions. And what it says is the minimax risk now is the same as before, k log d over n, except that you have a, an inverse dependence on the RE parameter. Right? And that RE parameter can go to zero as a function of d or n. So we can make the minimax rate whatever we like by building bad ensembles of x. Um, right, so this raises a question. This is something that sort of people in the area have wondered about for quite some time. Certainly I have. Um, I know others, including Nadi Schrebro, have. Um, is this just somehow an artifact of their analysis? Did, if we were more clever and did a better analysis of L1, could we get rid of that dependence? Because it shouldn't be there from a fundamental point of view. Um, or is this dependence on the RE constant, is this hinting at something more fundamental, a gap between polynomial and exponential time algorithms. Okay, so that question was sort of open, and um, what our result that I'll show next is answers it in a certain sense um, under this conjecture about average, about um, worst case hardness. Okay, so here's a lower bound, um, and this is going to be a lower bound that applies to any polynomial time algorithm, so it's a lower bound for the Lasso, but it's also a lower bound for anything that you might think about doing in polynomial time. Um, so it's a lower bound that involves the class P poly. This is essentially the class of polynomial time algorithms that can be encoded in circuits of polynomial size. So it's like the class P plus an advice string, a sort of bit of side information to the algorithm that's also of polynomial length. Now, it's, a, it's a widely believed that the class NP is not contained within P poly. That's only slightly stronger than NP not contained within and so what we prove under that condition is that you can fix any RE constant that you'd like. And what we'll do is we'll generate for you a fixed bad design matrix X. It will have exactly that RE constant. Um, I think to be precise, it's essentially equal to that. Um, and then what we'll guarantee is that for any polynomial time computable K-sparse K estimator, 
the minimax risk is lower bounded by exactly the same quantity. Okay? So what this says is that the, uh, the occurrence of an RE constant is not an artifact to the Lasso. The Lasso suffers from this problem as shown by Bickel, Ritov, and uh, Sipakov's result. But this result says that conditional on this hard case um, complexity result that's widely believed, any other polynomial time estimator suffers from that same dependence. Um, so it's kind of curious because you know, there's many ways in sparse linear models or compressed sensing, there's many ways of asking, is my method optimal? You can ask, you know, do I get a good estimate of theta star in L2 norm? If you do that, then L1 is essentially optimal up to constants. If you ask, do I recover the non-zeros in my sparse vector, that's support recovery variable selection. L1 is also essentially optimal for that. Again, there's some minor constant differences. Um, but this is a problem with prediction error where it's somehow very sensitive. And it's not just L1, it's, it's polynomial time algorithms. Um, so that's an interesting case where you can look at two forms of minimax risk, the constrained one and the polynomial time one, and there's a difference. Um, I think it's very interesting. I think many people are interested in this now. Are there other problems where we can find such differences? Can we get a more general understanding of what problems there aren't differences and what problems there are differences? So just to wrap up, um, there's various open questions here. Um, if you looked at the current theorem, it applies to algorithms, polynomial time algorithms that return case sparse vectors. So by that I mean that you're required, this theta hat is required to be a case sparse vector. Now, if you're just interested in prediction, you might say, well, that's unreasonable. Maybe I could get a better prediction with a non-case sparse um, vector. And that, that's a fair comment. Um, on the flip side, I could argue that for computational efficiency, it's nice to have case sparse predictors, and you only have k covariates that you have to use. Um, but that is an interesting open question, and it's, it's actually related to um, various questions in computational learning theory. Can you relax this kind of requirement um, to have a uniform lower bound on things that do not return case sparse vectors? Um, I think many people believe not. That they would believe this, this gap might go away, but that's, that's an open question here. Um, what interests me very much is that polynomial versus exponential time is an extremely crude distinction. Um, you know, when you do these reductions, of course, our proof involves a reduction. Um, the reduction is not entirely standard because we have a statistical problem, but we end up reducing in a certain form to the, um, the three-cover problem, the three-set covering problem. And when you do these reductions, you notice that you're just throwing polynomial factors out left and right. It's just, you know, it's a heyday with polynomial factors. And that's fine if all you care about is polynomial versus exponential. Um, but I would argue that what we really need here is a theory that can tell us about different orders of polynomial. Um, I would be very excited if we could have um, forms of computationally constrained minimax risk that sort of say over all cubic time algorithms, this is the form of the lower bound. Um, I don't know of such results yet. Um, I guess there isn't sort of a, a ready-made computational complexity theory for that yet, but obviously it's an interesting question. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, so what we've done here is in some ways visit, visit, revisited something that's very classical, statistical minimax. Um, we've argued that modern applications impose constraints that I think if the theory really is to be relevant, I guess I'm a strong believer that if you do theory, it should ultimately be relevant for what it's supposed to be modeling, and we are trying to model the, the problem of statistical estimation, so we should be modeling how it's done in practice. Um, so we need to think about memory and computational power, um, we need to think about privacy. I think that's going to be increasingly important. And something that I didn't talk about that's also interesting, we need to think about distributed algorithms and we need to study how Minirax risks scale as we limit the number of bits that can be communicated between processors. That's something, of course, that's also related to communication complexity in theoretical computer science. Thanks very much. Yeah, I, I would like to. I would like to ask.
two questions actually. Um, the first question relates to the little bit toward the bit towards the end, where you were talking about how the MP complete put a lower bound on the asymptotic behaviour. Mm. I'd be very, very worried about that sort of result. Not because I think it's wrong, mm. but because I've seen examples in the filtering where people have gone down completely the wrong path because of asymptotic statements. There are some well-known results in PD in one the filtering that say you can't asymptotically do better than one over root n. Mm. And there are other algorithms that have one over n to the quarter, mm. and people quite wrongly think they're much worse algorithms. In fact, they're much better algorithms than the optimal algorithms to take the middle of the two of them, run them both in parallel, and if the one takes longer than the other, give up, because the switchover between the two happens in the case where everything is already disastrous. And I'd be very worried about this giving information, actually persuading people not to think about the other algorithms, when potentially they are much better. Um, so I don't know if I thought about that. And the second question was going back to the early stuff, where you were talking about privacy. I won't disagree again with what you said, uh, except that I wonder whether it's the right measure of privacy, because in most cases, privacy arises not because of a single query, but because of actually multiple queries coming from different directions. And actually, you're measuring the amount of privacy in a single answer, but I think almost all serious breakdowns come from GCHQ and people patching together lots of obscure information together to get something quite... So those are the two questions. Okay. Yeah, those are great questions. How about I answer the, the second one first? Um, so the second one I sort of skipped over, but essentially you're pointing out that our, our notion of utility, we fixed one objective from a statistical point of view, one query in, in your language. And we're sort of optimizing for that query. But you're exactly right that in practice, you have a data set and you have multiple queries on it. And you have to protect against multiple queries, and you'd like to preserve utility for multiple queries simultaneously. So at some level, we've taken a step, but it's exactly this open question. If you have multiple statistical objectives, how do you formalize that kind of trade-off? I agree that's very interesting and, and should be pursued. Um, about your first question, I guess maybe first let me just clarify that I wouldn't call this theory asymptotic um, in the sense that these are all, all these results hold um, for all finite values of k, d, and n. Now, to be fair, this little equal sign with a squiggle is hiding a constant. So your point might be that the constants are so large that if the exponent's different, I don't see the difference until n is 10 billion. Exactly, exactly. Um, but for instance, in this theorem, I could give you quite small constants. They're not like 2 to the 10. The constants are like, I haven't optimized them to like 8 or 10 or something. They're, they're perfectly reasonable. And so these theoretical predictions are kicking in for regimes of NKD that are relevant in practice. But that's a very good point. I, I have to admit, I've done some theory where I didn't worry about constants, and then when I implemented it, I saw the constant was swamping everything up until you know, such a large problem that it wasn't really feasible yet. On the privacy part, can you explain the two beta plus two? Even for I mean, it, you know, at, at the alpha squared thing somehow made sense that there should be something like that. But why, for any alpha positive or net, I mean, less than one or whatever? Mm. So why this? That, yeah, why that? Yeah. Okay, so what happens when you do density estimation? Let's say you do it with an orthogonal series estimate. You get a bias in the variance term. Right? And you, you optimize those two terms by choosing sort of the effective dimension of the problem, namely the number of coefficients that you keep. And the rate you get is d over, d over n, where d is the d as a function of n that you chose. Um, when you have privacy here, you get an extra factor in your, um, in your variance term. You have an extra factor of d in your variance term, so instead of d over n, you get d squared over n. And because of that, the effective dimension is chosen differently, and you lose a bit of power on your exponent. And where that additional dimension comes from, um, this isn't a concrete answer, but this is dimension-dependent contraction. You lose a dimension-dependent factor in your mutual information, and so in the lower bound, that's where the exponent gets dropped. So that's a great question. Thanks. Any more questions? Since, like, the private privacy or whatever uh, model that it almost seems like the communication channel model in the statistical information theory. Is that something related to those two models? 
Um, yeah, so no, you're exactly right. There is sort of an information that are channel interpretation of this. Um, let me just show you, let's go back to the, the model. Right, so this, this is a channel. Um, actually, I didn't talk in detail, but there are different kinds of these channels. There's sort of interactive and non-interactive channels. Interactive channels, each zi is a function only of xi. That's a very simple kind of mechanism. Interactive channels, the zi's can depend on all the other x's. That's more complicated. We have theory for both kinds of channels. Um, but you're exactly correct that at some level, the theorems that we're proving are not exactly capacity theorems because we're not getting sharp constants, but they're of the flavor of sort of Shannon coding type theorems. Yes. Um, when you look at a statistical estimation problem, um, and essentially if you read Kolmogorov's paper, this is already inherent in it, the capacity of a statistical problem is basically the mutual information divided by the metric entropy. Metric entropy at sort of scale delta. And so a, a lot of these lower bounds are controlling exactly that ratio, and that's, that's a notion of capacity. Um, the paper by Barron and Yang from Annals of Stat in 99 is, is a very nice um, overview of that kind of perspective. Any more questions? Okay, that's, thanks, that's for me.